Welcome to the Courageous Entrepreneur Show. This is the show that shares information and inspiration to help you break free from self-doubt, limiting beliefs and disempowering patterns, and break through to create the thriving, successful business you dream of and deserve. I'm your host, Winnie Anderson. The show features interviews with entrepreneurs who've overcome amazing challenges to create success on their terms and experts who share insight and practical information to help you move forward with courage, confidence, and clarity. The show is available in both video and audio formats on a variety of platforms, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, in the Google Play Store, on YouTube, and on my website at winnieanderson.com. If you like what you hear, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the show on the platform you've consumed it, and please leave a great review on that platform. That'll help others see its value. And please share the show with others in your networks. This interview is with Mike McCallowitz. He is a multi New York Times bestselling author. He is a very successful business owner. He and he speaks. He has uh, built and sold multiple multi million dollar businesses. He's also the I think a four time or more than four time as I said multi New York Times bestselling author. He's written business classics like The Pumpkin Plan, Profit First, Surge, and the perennial bestseller, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. Originally, I had interviewed Mike for my first podcast, The Let's Talk Tech Show. But right after I finished that interview, well, I decided to stop doing that show and to start doing this one. So I decided to hold on to the interview with Mike and to release it with the Courageous Entrepreneur Show. So the audio version of this video actually was released as part of Launch Week way back when I launched the show's first season. But I never released the video. That's a really long story. But So I wanted to make sure I got the video out, and I thought this would be a good time for me to do it. The, uh, the video that you're going to see First of all, if anything could have gone wrong in an interview, this was one of them. You're going to notice that Mike has two different shirts on. And that's because the power went out at my house in the middle of the first interview. So luckily, he was gracious enough to come back on and to finish that interview. And he ended up giving me a tremendous amount of his time and shared just fantastic information, great insight. But you are going to notice this little quirk about 30 minutes in where suddenly his, uh, his shirt changes and I make kind of a funny face and that's because there was a really ugly break in the video. Sorry about that. So um, I want to share with you what we cover. This is really great information. You're probably going to want to take notes. So he's going to share the single biggest thing to do to lay a foundation of profitability, how patterns of the past can actually keep us trapped where we are or worse, set us back. He talks about the big mistake that we can make when trying to course correct, and it can actually make things worse, not better. He'll talk about two ways to scale your business and give you tips for choosing which one of those ways is best for you. He talks about why building your strengths and hiring to manage your weaknesses is actually the key to success. The simple three-part rule that helps you put a problem into perspective so you can actually make good choices. Why a rally cry is important and how to create yours. Why it's important to and how to be seen as a recognized expert. As I said, you're probably going to want to watch this more than once, and I suggest you take some notes. So sit back and enjoy this interview with Mike McCallowitz. All right, so welcome, Mike. Are you ready to talk tech? Absolutely, Wendy. Bring it. Bring it on. <laughs> All right, great. I'm so glad to have you here today. I'm so you have a great startup checklist as part of the online resources for the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, which I think that was your first book, right? Yes, eight years ago. Wow. That's so, and that list is eight years old, too, so if you're going to quiz me on it, 
I'm a little nervous now. Oh, man, I was. All right, well, we'll, we'll scrap that then. But um, I think that really service-based businesses are slightly different. They kind of start with no, and I'm probably projecting here, but I think most of us start with no other real plan other than that we've got these gifts, these skills, and we just want to use them, right? We, we yes. get infected or we run away from our corporate life and decide we're going to start this business on our own. But so for the person who's launched a business and is maybe a few years into their entrepreneurial journey, but mm -hmm. they're still not earning what they want, they're not satisfied with where they are, what do you think is the the place they need to start? Where do you think they need to start to make that next big leap? Yeah, so if you started off by doing what you're good at, uh, I want you to recognize that you may own your own quote unquote business, but if the business is just you, you're still an employee, just your boss is not for one corporation, it's always a little right. owner of these clients you work for, they're your new bosses. So you, you really haven't changed. It's actually a mind shift that needs to happen. We need to move from, as Michael Gerber puts it, working in the business to working on the business. So the question is, what is, of your existing clients, you already started, of your existing clients, what's the most common recurring, and this is the big thing, what's the most common recurring need? Maybe with your existing one client, what they need over and over, but across your entire client base, what's the one thing they seem to need over and over again? Once you identify it, that's the thing we need to systematize. That's the thing that we have to stop doing ourselves and spend the time and effort to document or record or at least prepare some form of system around it so that we can make our first hire. And that first hire, maybe it's a contractor, maybe it's a part-time employee, maybe it's your mother-in-law helping you out, but you want to bring in someone else to actually do the work. But there's one other trap, Winnie, I want you to be aware of. When I'm doing the work, maybe I'm not making enough money to be satisfy my lifestyle, but say I'm netting, just for round number six, 20 or 30, actually that's made it real easy, $20 an hour. Let's say I am making by doing my own work, at the end of the day, I net $20 an hour. When I hire someone else to do the work, I need to pay them. Maybe them, maybe their cost is $15 an hour, their hourly work and maybe some other costs associated with it. Now when they do the work, the net effect to me is only $5 an hour. And people go, oh my God, I'm, I'm barely surviving on 20 bucks an hour. If I have someone else to do it, I'm gonna make five bucks an hour. I'm gonna die, I can't do this. But what we have to realize is when someone else does it for $5 an hour, it requires zero effort during that time of ours. So that's free money. And if I can get a second person generating $5 an hour, and then a third, and then a fourth, now I'm making $20 an hour with no effort. And then we hire the fifth, now making $25 an hour, with no effort. So once you stop doing the work yourself and engage another person or system to do the work, you may feel a dip actually in your income, but your profitability per hour will start to skyrocket because it's not a time for money trap anymore. Other people, other things are doing the work for you. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that I I always heard when I was a corporate trainer, uh, as, as well, well as now that I'm uh, out on my own as a consultant, but it's easier for me to do it myself, and it's yeah. less time, and, you know, trying to help people to understand that this really is an investment, and that if you take that time and systematize, that employee, yes, is going to free you up to do the big stuff that you should be doing. Yeah, the, the paradigm shift I like people to make, and what you said is 100% true what people say, and it's 100% true. If I do the work myself, it will be better. I will do it faster. I'm more skilled at it, and I'll make more money for that day. Like if I do the work instead of giving the money to someone else. It's all true. The one thing people don't think about, Winnie, is there's only a certain amount of time in each day. Working hours, 12 a day, maybe you can pull off 16 hours a day. Every day, I'd be surprised, but maybe you can do 16 hours a day. If, if you could do 16 hours a day and you make $10 an hour, you can generate $160 during that time. But what if you hired 20 people? Now it's 20 times 16 hours because they all could technically work 16 hours a day. So now you have 200, 340 hours. Well, now 340 times 10, that's 3,400. So the math is you can unlimitedly expand if you allow other people to do the work. If we continue to do it ourselves, we will hit a ceiling very quickly. And that's where most people are. They're like, I'm working my, my, my ass off, and I'm not making any more money. I can't grow anymore. What do I need to do? 
you got to get out of your own way. That's the time you have to bring systems into your business. You have to allow other people to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Amen on that one. I think we do. We just get so really caught up in that. I, I want to be in de truly independent. And part of the reason why I got out of corporate life was because I hated managing employees to right. be with. Right. Because, oh, my gosh. But it, it is. It's so critical for us to be able to scale and get to that point of what we had in our fantasy when we first started this stuff to begin with. Because, yeah, that, that replacing one job for another, you know, the, the old joke that and the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who will work 80 hours for themselves because they won't work 40 for somebody else, I think is really true. Yeah, that's totally true. It's totally true. Now, the other thing is not all of us like to manage other employees and have a team. We like to just be our solo person. You can then become an expert. That's the other opportunity. If we stay, and there's a, the analogy is like uh, doctors. Doctors often are solo practitioners. Maybe they have a, a office now with multiple people, but usually they're basically a solo practitioner. The doctor does the work. Well, you have general practitioners and you have specialists, heart surgeons, neurosurgeons. The general practitioner attracts the general audience. They can analyze if I have a skin rash or a nagging cough or a fever. But they can only, because they, they address so many different things, they can only address the surface level. If that nagging cough actually is indicative of a heart problem, that's when they say, ooh, uh, I shouldn't be, what you need is a surgeon uh, or a heart specialist. Let me refer you to someone else. Now, the heart specialist, she gets a massive premium where the general practitioner is lucky to get a $50 copay or $25 copay and whatever the insurance company will give them. The heart surgeon, you know, if the heart surgeon came to us and said, you know, even for a meeting, it's $5,000, we'll find, as the customer, we'll find a way to find those funds because our life is on the line. But the greatest irony is how the heart surgeon gets there. She got there by doing the exact same process over and over and over to a mastery level. No one wants to go to a heart surgeon and say, um, I heard I'm your first patient ever. I don't know. You want to be like the 1,000th patient. Yeah. You want the repeated experience. So the lesson for us is this. If we don't want to grow, scale with people, you can scale your expertise. And that means pick a very narrow thing you do and become so extraordinarily good at you that your clients who have a life-threatening situation, their business is on the line, will come to you and pay a massive premium because you do that process specifically. And the, the, the beautiful benefit is because you do the same process over and over, there's actually less learning. You don't have to constantly be learning new things. You master the one thing right. and keep doing that. Yeah, so it's really almost permission that you're giving yourself to, to funnel out or, or push away all of the other stuff, the other possibilities, so that you really can be this this standout person in that industry segment and almost a magnet really for the people who want the outcome that you produce. And this is really the foundation of the pumpkin plan, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 And it also translates into technology, by the way, in that when we pick a, a specific group that we're going to cater to, there's only certain tools we need. Like the heart, going back to the heart surgeon, the heart surgeon says, you know, I need certain scalpel, certain tools, and they, they're constantly investigating the new technology, but it's in their vertical. Conversely, the general practitioner has to get new diagnostic software and technology for, and, and tools for the Zika virus, new software databases. For, they're constantly learning new things, and their knowledge of technology must be very diverse, where a master is very specific. And this is what I talk about in the pumpkin plan. The pumpkin plan, the book I wrote, I studied pumpkin farmers and found that the small faction of farmers, colossal farmers specifically, changed the process of growing a pumpkin by very little compared to the ordinary pumpkin farmer, and the pumpkin responds with explosive growth. Well, I found in businesses, there's a few tweaks we need to make, and we just hit on the first one. Focus on one customer segment and one skill set, and you'll very quickly become world-renowned in that skill set. because. And for in that community, because everyone knows you. If if you, if, you know, the reason, if you and I went online today and said, that, you know, I have a heart problem. Who's the world's best heart surgeon? There are forums talking about that person. There is things to do. But if I say, you know, my computer is having problems. Does anyone know a computer guy? There'll be millions of choices. Yeah. So in any small community, the world's elite arises to the top, and everyone talks about that guy or that girl. Yeah. So that's part of the pumpkin plan is very focused service and offering to a very specific community, and automatically the marketing happens for you because the community talks about you. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that all, it cognitively makes sense, and you can, you can really recognize it in your own consumer behavior. You yeah. know, you seek out experts, too. I think the biggest challenge, of course, is the emotional crap that we yes. drag into junk. our entrepreneur journey with us. And some of it comes from the baggage from corporate life where maybe we worked someplace where we had to be a jack of all trades, yes. right? And, and we had to follow a certain process that was not our own. So it's almost like we have to unlearn that behavior and then d rediscover who we actually are. It's, that's perhaps the hardest, biggest challenge we all face is what got us here is exactly the thing that won't get us there. And we all stay stuck in, in patterns. I think about you know a relationship. That's an easy analogy. If we look at uh, maybe you're in a relationship with someone that was just a bad relationship, or maybe you've seen this in a friend, at a certain point they say, enough is enough. I am done with this relationship. And then two weeks later, they're back together or they enter the same relationship because there is comfort in the familiar. It may not be great, it may suck, but at least it's familiar. And it's more comfortable to do something that we're familiar with than to try something out that we've never done. That is usually terrifying. Even though that thing we've never done could be a thousand times better, because we haven't done it, we're not familiar, and therefore we're extraordinarily uncomfortable with that. So many of us at a certain point say, enough with the corporate world, or whatever it is, I'm done. But then when we start our own business or move on to the next stage, we go back to what we're already familiar with because that's comfortable, and we start repeating those patterns. Yep. The, the lesson I found is this. If you're not satisfied with where you are, you must do a serious investigation of what you've been doing over the last five years. Are you repeating a pattern? If you are, you are trapped by your pattern, and exactly you said, we got to clear that head junk. You have to have the courage to do something you've never done before. Because what is, if you continue to do what you're doing, you will continue to guarantee to get the same results that you're unsatisfied with. Yeah. Therefore, you have to have the boldness, the courage to do something new. Yeah, that's brilliant, Mike. And, and that really leads into this concept that you talk about, about how most entrepreneurs really just need to make a 5% change yes. for things to really be better. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's an analogy I used that a business coach gave to me about airplanes, and uh, it's a great visual for me about the changes we need to make. If you look at an airplane, so I live right outside New York City, we were talking about New Jersey earlier, uh, and it's flying to, say, California. If the plane is off its course only by 5%, as it travels, the more distance it covers, the further it gets away from the destination. So, and that's true in our, our lives too. If we're just off of course of where we intend to go and we keep moving, we actually get further and further away and get more and more frustrated. Then what happens is we say, oh God, we need the course correct and we oversteer, like when a car is going out of control. So what do we do? We say, no, nothing's working. I need to change everything. That's probably the words we use. I'm doing a 180 on my life. Today everything stops. And we, we make these magnificent big steps but they're so big that it actually now course over course corrects us. So we're here, and now we're going here. And sometimes we loop around, and now our plane is going like this, and it never gets to our destination. This is the great news about our lives. If you're running a business today, regardless of where the business is, I know you've attracted some prospects. You've, made, you've got some clients. You were able to deliver some degree of service or products that, that has helped them pay you, meaning they were satisfied with it, and they decided – it's good enough to depart with money. There's millions of things you're doing right. It's actually just a few things that need to be corrected. Maybe it is picking a niche. Maybe it is refining your service offering. Maybe it is making that first hire. But if we try to fix everything at once, our plane is going to be all over the place. Make one correction. That's the plane analogy. And I got one more analogy. Mm -hmm. I'm a co-owner in a manufacturing business, and I discovered something fascinating about manufacturing. Say we're making a pen. I said I have to have a pen here. You know, there's all these different parts. The array, that's not a razor, but a scripto at the top and the metal and the ink in the middle. All those parts come together. If the end product is not proper, if there's an error or problem with it, the propensity many people have is say, oh, I think it's, not, it's, not, it's a poor fit of the resource, the um, ingredients here, the metal and stuff. It's not fitting properly. Let's fix that. Or it could be that the ink uh, is coming in dry, so let's fix that. And they fix multiple things at once. Now, here's the problem. If you try to fix multiple things at once, the end product may get fixed. But then you say, 
I don't know how I fixed it. It was one of these many things. Or maybe it was a combination. Conversely, it may not be fixed. And he's like, well, I have no idea. I tried to fix everything, and it's not fixed. It may actually even come out worse. So now the question is, what made it worse? So what manufacturers do is called a one dial at a time correction. You look at all the possible causes of this and you, the problem, and you determine what's the most likely cause of this, and let's turn that one dial and fix it. Then you sit back and you watch, have the results changed? Is it better? Is it not better? Or is it worse? If it's better, you're probably on the right dial. If it's the same, it's probably not that dial. And then you set that dial back to exactly where it was. You observe it's still the same. And then you pick the next dial. And if it's worse, well, clearly this dial has impact on it, but that needs to be reset and you try another dial. So if you do one thing at a time, you can probably measure the results and make subsequent adjustments. If you try to fix everything at once, and entrepreneurs are notorious for this, we start spinning cycles and we don't even know. If things start working, we don't know how it worked, and therefore we can't sustain it. Yeah, that is a great analogy, Mike. It really is, and, and very powerful. Thanks, do you Do you think that part of that problem is because a lot of times we, we tend to work in isolation a, a lot? I mean, we're very focused on, you know, doing doing the work and and it's really that's the nature of solopreneur right it's all it's just all all me oh yeah yeah well of, of course there's no question isolation does that because this is the trees from the forest you know inside the forest outside the forest when you're inside the forest you cannot see the trees around you you got that big tree stump in front of you and that's what we focus on from the outside people can see with clarity of what's going on or at least from a different vantage point mm -hmm. and that really it's a combination of the two Back to that manufacturing business, I am not an active partner, meaning I don't go to the office I don't or the workshop. I don't build things, but I'm passively involved. I communicate with the owner once a day, once a week. We'll do a, a full investigation, and the beauty of this is I have no emotional attachment while he does. So he sees a problem, and he can get very frustrated by it and say, this is the biggest problem our company is having. It's putting us under. It's killing me because all of his energy is there, all his frustration is there. But me from the outside, I can say, hold on, um, I understand your frustration, but looking at the numbers and the flow, that problem is very minor compared to another issue. We should be focusing here. Right. So by getting people with an outside vantage point, ideally, who are not invested in the business emotionally, you'll get these two vantage points and be able to investigate both. And sometimes the actual solution you're seeking is in the middle of the two. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think that that concept, uh, I first read about it in uh, Think and Grow Rich by oh, Napoleon great. Hill, where he talks about being detached from the outcome. I yeah. must have read that stinking book 15 times, read that same concept uh, before it finally fully hit me. And yeah, I can tell you when I first recognized or realized, I should say, that I was emotionally attached to every outcome, because, yeah. you know, as a solopreneur, you feel like it is all about you. And I even had a client tell me that I feel like every rejection is, is a rejection of me personally. That tells you you're emotionally attached to the outcome. And it's so hard, I think, to then look at things really objectively when you are attached. So that's where maybe a mastermind or some other kind of group. Very powerful. Yeah. We, we fall victim. So I, 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 I wish it only took me 15 times to understand this reading. <laughs> it took me about 100, and I still don't fully get it because these are emotions. They're ingrained in us. Right. And while we can logically understand it, I still get caught up in it. There's a theorem called the recency effect. This is a behavioral theorem. And it shows that we put a disproportionate, a significant amount of weight on something that's in the immediate uh, happening immediately versus futuristically. So uh, my own business, like, listen, I've grown many companies now. My own business, what's the hot topic for today? You know, a lot of attention gets put on that to the detriment of ignoring the long-term things. Uh, there's a great example with this is um, if you ask, if you punch someone in the face and say, how's your day going? Wait until see what they say. If you give someone a million dollar check and say, hey, how's your day going or how's your life going, see how they respond. That punched in the face, life is miserable. That million dollar check, life is perfect. But that is just something that happened in one millisecond, but we put a huge amount of weight on it. There's a, a great tool you can use, and it's actually not a tech tool, but man, it should be designed as a simple software app because it's powerful. It's called the 10 10 10 rule. I believe it was created by Susie Welch. Uh, she is the wife of Jack Welch of GE fame. 
Um, but she came up with this amazing idea and wrote an entire book about it. Yeah, so Susie Welsh had this really cool concept, and she calls it the 10-10-10 rule. And what it does is it shifts our perspective. So many of us are reactionary. We, um, we, we feel pain in the moment, for example, and if you ask someone, how are you feeling, they'll say, miserable, I've felt miserable my entire life. You know, if I'm sick now, I'm always sick. Whatever happens in the moment, right. there's a sense of that's always the case. The problem is it, it really hampers our decision-making. It, it makes us very reactionary. So if, if a situation presents itself, the immediate information in front of us will make a, dis, a decision on. Say we have a client who calls and says, uh, you, you know, you guys are the worst company I've ever worked with. I'm going to sue you. Uh, I'm never going to do business with you again, and uh, you know I, I'm never I'm not going to pay this bill and say it's a thousand dollar bill or something. Well, in the moment, there's so much hostility and anger, there's so much pain that we may say this client has taken advantage of me so long. I'm finally going to stick my foot in the ground here, claim my space, and I'm going to sue them. And that thousand dollars, they're going to pay that plus you know interest and all this stuff. Well, Susie Wells says stay, stop for a second and do a ten 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 rule. And what that means is look at this situation in the perspective of the next 10 hours, the next 10 months, and the next 10 years. So what's the impact of our decision in the next 10 hours? Well, if I sue them back, I'll feel relief. I'll feel that I'm getting my revenge and that this customer won't take advantage of me. Maybe won't take advantage of people in the future. But now she says, look at the next 10 months. What's the emotion going to be in 10 months? Well, 10 months from now, I know myself, this situation uh, will be long past me. It'll be a little blip in the radar. I'll have replaced this client. And actually, I don't even like working with this client, so I'll feel relief that they're gone. Um, and that will be good. But if I sue them now, I also know that I'll be going through this pain of still having to process the suit. It takes two years. It'll weigh my mind every day. There's going to be a lot of stress worrying about it. Um, and in 10 years, you know, if I look at the 10-year perspective, there's no impact. Like this customer means nothing to me. The only consequence is going to be years of fighting this thing out in the in the, the law, uh, the court of law, and it's it's over a thousand dollars. So why have caused stress for all these years? In 10 years, I won't even remember this person's name. So if we look at this 10, 10, 10, then we say, you know what? In the heated moment, I want to sue and get my revenge, but the long-term consequence, it isn't worth it. I'll even forget about these people sooner if I just drop it. So her rules is a, is a way for us to avoid that extraordinary weight we put on the moment and try to give us just a little bit of a reality check. And that little sample I shared with you, that's actually a real case. That's my case. I had that exact situation oh, wow. happen. It was a uh, – oops, I clicked on the wrong button here. We, it, it was the, uh, a law firm. I had installed some antivirus software in their computer. They said, you know, the software didn't prevent a virus or something. And they said they're going to sue me. Uh, they won't pay any of the bills. And uh, my out-of-pocket cost was maybe $500. I had to buy the software. And I, I felt not only was I innocent of their charges, that we actually prevented uh, even this more significant damage from this brand-new virus that the virus software couldn't catch. So... I thought they were really taking advantage of me because they're a law firm. It costs nothing to sue, threaten with suing. But I actually decided when I did this 10-10-10 rule, just drop it. And honestly, I don't know, I don't know the person's name anymore. I don't care. And the next, within a couple of days, I was sleeping well. In other cases, I have gone through lawsuits where either my company was sued or in other cases, I've sued other companies. And the stress that it causes for so long in the way in my mind, it hasn't been worth it. That 10-10 rule, 10, 10, 10 rule saved me that time, and I use it now very regularly to get perspective. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I think that also ties into something that I think you talked about in Profit First, which helps you think about should I make this expenditure? You know, when we're weighing these big decisions, thinking about it, I think in that how is this going to impact me because we're, you know, we're in this for the long haul. I think, right. that, yeah, that's a great way to consider anything that you're really wrestling with that is it really that important and what kind of impact is it going to have ultimately on your business your peace of mind your reputation etc yeah it's powerful and i think you should use it for almost all situations it, it, it happens in a flash i mean i walked yeah. you through it over five minutes but it happens in a flash i heard another rule that i'm just starting to play with um and i 
I, I remember now where I read it. There's a new book out from Robert Cialdini or Cialdini. I'm not even sure how to pronounce mm -hmm. it. It's called Persuasion. He wrote a very famous book called Influence uh, a couple of decades right. ago. Uh, it's the Bible for persuasion tactics. Well, Prefluence is his pre the, the follow-up book to this. And he talks about a concept. Now, actually, now I don't recall if it was Robert Cialdini, but I'm going to give him credit. He talks about a concept called the uh, not instead of if-then, but when then concept. And the if then concept is if uh, if it's raining out, I will bring an umbrella. The when uh, then concept is when it rains out, I'll bring a, uh, an umbrella. And what this is, is when we start speaking this way in our mind, if we preset our mind with certain actions we're gonna take and we put a when trigger, our mind subconsciously sees something as inevitable. And then we will more likely, according to this article or book, more likely take the action. So when it rains out, I'll grab my umbrella. Or when my business gets sued, I will sit down and evaluate this from a logical standpoint. And it presets our mind so that when we get thrust into something that can be very emotional or heated, you know, and, and this is not just on a negative side like a lawsuit, but it could be on an opportunistic side. There's a great deal um, with this, this business partnership that, that seems so attractive. You know, when great deals present themselves, I will take 48 hours to evaluate them. If I have that rule preset in my mind, when it presents itself, I'll go into this 10-10-10 mode. So it's another little tactic, and I've just started to experiment with it, so far so good, in preparing ourselves to, to not go through these very reactionary uh, responses, which, can, which on the positive or negative side can put us into a tailspin, quite frankly. Yeah, and I, I really like that concept. I've been thinking a lot lately about the positives that we experienced in our corporate lives. And, you know, a lot of us ran away in horror or, or thank God that we were laid off and we could then, you know, create this new venture on our own. But there really were some positives to corporate life. And I think one of them are these, these pre-made structures, you know, that when these opportunities come up, you're going to be forced to go through these processes and policies to, to think them through. And sometimes I think we're a little bit too, woohoo, I get to run by, you know, fly by the seat of my pants and I get to be in charge. Yeah. And do, when, yeah, I think these kinds of processes we could probably borrow from our corporate life and create or reduce stress for ourselves on making these decisions. Yeah, that's yeah, totally true. That, that's awesome. So I watched a video with you where you talked about your rally cry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And, and that your particular rally cry is to eliminate entrepreneurial poverty, which yes. I love. So can you talk about this concept, what that is, and then, you know, where did yours come from? Yeah. So the specific words I use is eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And the, the important thing about a rally cry, and it actually just happened here, is it isn't important that people memorize words, eliminate, eradicate. It's that people connect with the concept. That's the idea. A rally cry, um, and by the way, I found out the technical uh, li literary way is rallying. The rallying. A yeah. rallying cry, but I like rally cry. It just sounds like a more definitive, stronger thing, so I took poetic license. But a rally cry is kind of the X on the map. It's that point where you're headed toward, and it's something that resonates with, with your soul, with your heart, with wh however you want to define it, but it's something that connects with you at a visceral level. And it's that X on the map that you continually pound the drum to, and others will be either attracted to it or repelled by it. So for me, to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty, it came about with this realization that I had. As I grew my businesses, I was actually becoming more impoverished. Well, on the outside, I looked like a success. I had a, a $3 million company and a $7 million company. It looks so successful on the outside for a small business, but on the inside, the stress and panic, like I couldn't afford to cover payroll uh, by refinancing my house because I already did it three times. I, I was willing to sell anything to anybody just to get enough money in to keep the business afloat one more month. And I found out that the vast majority of entrepreneurs live in this kind of check-by-check -check survival. And that as their revenue increases, it's really a vanity point. So there's a saying that revenue is vanity, profit is sanity. You know, the revenue number just we can pound our chest about, but it's really the profitability that, that speaks to our sanity, our, our uh, strength, and that 
that's what needs to be served. So when I had this realization about myself that, that I was a, a impoverished entrepreneur and then discovered that 83% of the world's population of small businesses, and by the way, there's about 80 million small businesses in the world, that 83% of these businesses are surviving check by check. They are impoverished entrepreneurs. And so that's my mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. It's something I'm trying to fix permanently for myself. I have in the short term, I just need to live this for the rest of my life. And as I follow this path, I want others to do it. So a rally cry is once I'm clear on my life's purpose, step one. Step two is have the, my business become an amplification of my life's purpose, kind of the, the platform around what I feel driven to do, and then speak to that, not in those exact words, but speak to that mission every single day. This morning, we had our morning huddle. There, we're a small business. There's seven of us or eight of us now. We sit around and we say, listen, we are here to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And then people even share their own stories about how they experience poverty, not poverty, you know, homeless on the street necessarily, but where you know, just one, uh, uh, one of the women here at the office said for 10 years, uh, Christmas, they never exchanged a gift, not because the family didn't want to, they didn't have enough money. And it, it, it resonates with her strongly and she feels compelled and driven to fix that mm -hmm. for the future. So by having a rally cry, you start finding people that also have that element in them. These, these aren't clones of you, but these are people that are also drawn to that mission. And it's not just the employees you hire, it's the, the uh, clients that you serve. When they hear that you're here to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty, some will get it and say, I know that, I need that, I need that fixed. And others will say, I don't even understand what that means, see ya. It's the ultimate sales filter. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. So it really is that true north that yeah, you yeah. see. And, and I think that having that kind of concept, embracing that, can really then help you hone in. It gives, like, gives you permission to say, no, I don't do that. No, I'm not into that. And, and sometimes we're overwhelmed by all of the exciting options and the creative ideas that we have. Right. That's the other thing. It, it is that true north. It's that beacon. And opportunities constantly present themselves. There was an interview of Steve Jobs. I believe it was in the final book written about him. Maybe it was elsewhere. But there was an interview of Steve Jobs. And the journalist asked him, I think, the most important question you could ask. What do you attribute your repeated success to? Now, think about it. He grew Apple from nothing to a wild success, was terminated from his own company, and then invited back to resuscitate it and bring it to the highest level it ever performed at. He's the founder of Pixar. It's a billion dollar operation. He also founded Next Computers. That was a failure after it achieved $100 million in revenue. I mean, he had these stratospheric climbs again and again. And he said, how do you have this repeated success? And he said, if I have to attribute it to one thing, it's been my discipline of saying no to some of the greatest opportunities on this planet. That's what success is. Success isn't doing everything. It's not grabbing all the opportunities. Opportunities abound. There's an abundance of opportunities. The, six, the ultimate successful entrepreneurs and business leaders identify the thing that is their true north, what resonates with them, and they hold on to that tiger's tail for the life of, of themselves and their business. They don't lose that focus. And they have the discipline, the absolute discipline of saying no to all the distractions, as great as they may be. Yeah, that that's fantastic. Absolutely. So there's a there's something that's been rolling around in my head that really ties to this conversation that we've been having about your your various books and, and your your perspective and the work that you do with with entrepreneurs and it's this and I know that as soon as you say it you're probably gonna you know internally roll your eyes thankfully I'm sure you'll resist that temptation to, <laughs> to my face it, there's this this thing about service professionals consultants coaches licensed professionals of all types and I'm thinking specifically about the corporate escapee you know yeah, the director yeah. the VP the manager of maybe a, a behind-the-scenes kind of a staff type of position right and I've heard my friends and colleagues say this too we're not the kind of people who sit back look at a need in the marketplace and then go, yep, I'm going to start selling that because people need that, fills a gap. We tend to launch our, our practices 
along the lines of what you're talking about. There's some mm -hmm. kind of calling that we feel drawn to. We have gifts that we're very aware of and that we love to use and that we want to use all the time. Yeah. And so can you talk about specifically how then do service professionals become the biggest pumpkin in the in the Yeah, patch? yeah, okay. Okay, now I'm definitely not rolling my eyes. Uh, all right, good. Because it, it is an absolute challenge. People go into the market saying, this is what I want to do, and then no one buys it. That's a failed venture. I mean, and I've seen it. People say, I got the greatest idea in the world. I'm hyped up about it, and there's no con consumption for it. So it is a match, match of the two. But there's a saying, I, this is my, our new office. I haven't set it up yet. It's still my old office. I have it hanging on the wall. And I, it's a philosopher. Um, I don't remember who said it, but it goes basically like this. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I think a lot, I think some, a portion of people go into a business because they say, oh, I can make money here. Well, that person hasn't come alive around what they do. And someone else that goes in there with absolute vigor and excitement, that energy will transmit. I, I, in my first book, in The Toy Paper Entrepreneur, I wrote about you know, two great warriors, one that's hired to fight and another one who is fighting because of his love for his own country. You know, who are you going to put your money on? Probably the ones doing for the love of their country. They just have that extra something, that intangible. They volunteered for something. And the Davids take down the Goliaths in that situation. Here's what I think we need to do. First, we do need to define what makes us come alive. That's the rally cry. That's our internal mission. Okay. But then we must do this thing called alignment. So let me talk about what alignment's not. It's not pivoting. It's a very popular term right now out there called pivoting. And pivoting states that identify what customers need, provide a degree of service or product that caters to that, observe their behavior as their needs change or you have a better understanding of their needs, adjust your offering. Which it totally makes sense. The only problem is it's only half the formula because I've seen businesses that pivot until the owner resents their business. They're doing a business that they never wanted to do in the first place. And yeah, they're generating money, but they're generating st stress and resentment toward their business because it's not their passion. The tweak to pivot is alignment. Identify your true north. Then say, what, is, what do clients need that aligns with what I want to do? For example, and here's, a, here's an outrageous example. You may have no interest in toilet paper manufacturing. You may say, I, <laughs> that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> God bless to those people. But there is clearly a need for toilet paper that's existed forever, and I think it'll go a little bit longer. But you may have a calling for environmental responsibility. Those things can match. Once you identify, I want to have a positive impact on the environment, and now I see that clients need toilet paper, I can match environmentally responsible toilet paper and have a huge impact on the market. I could re-educate the market about the damage, uh, you know, the bleaching process, all these things that go on, and introduce this new toilet paper. I can be energetic and enthused about it. I can start changing the world, and I can have a rally cry of let's save the planet together, <laughs> and there's an opportunity there. So I, I think the mistake is say, oh, the, the companies or, or the, the client base needs toilet paper or they need XYZ and saying, I have no interest. That's a mistake. First, identify what you want and be very clear about it. Then look at the market and what the market needs and align your offering to what the market needs. That's where the opportunity resides. Okay. So it really comes back then to that true north, that, that rally cry, that what is it that the change that you most want to bring to the world and that you're gifted to bring that change. Yes, and okay. it does have to be in that sequence. We have okay. to explore ourselves first. And I'm saying this from experience. Yeah. Um, and here, here's another little rule, is whenever, uh, I had a business coach who told me uh, probably the, the smartest thing I ever heard, and uh, I asked him about a client, so I'm, you know, I'm considering uh, serving this kind of client base, what do you think? And his first response was, I'm gonna tell you, that whatever I say, do not listen to me. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he said, the mistake that so many of us make is that we listen to the expert and believe that they have this guru advice, but they're not the customer. How can they speak to their, have their own biases steeped in? But even as I'm sharing this, Winnie, the stuff I'm saying, whoever is listening in right now, if it doesn't resonate with you, that's cool. Then it's not right for you. I'm just talking from experience. Yeah. 
And in my own businesses, my first businesses, I did what the customers needed. I had a, a specific talent, computer technology and so forth, and said customers need it. But a talent is not the same as a calling. And while those businesses were uh, successful from the outside, they grew and so forth, I, they were resentful from the inside. I didn't like working for them. Now I can tell you I am the most passionate and happy I've ever been in my life in the last 10 years because I realigned my business with myself. I, I spent years, and I still do it every day, asking myself, what's my life's purpose? Why am I here? And I got more and more clarity around it. And it does shift. There's little tweaks to it. And, and, it, and it, over time, it shifts. But there is a stronger and stronger clarity. And by asking myself a life's purpose, then all the things that I'm capable of and all those things that customers wanted, I then started putting the puzzle pieces together and said, oh, I, I got to be an author. I, I got to write books. This is the way I can carry the message. It's passion. I love it. I got to do public speaking. I can impact people, and I love it. And I got to do X, Y, Z. And all these elements made sense. They're all aligned. They're all very focused, and they all go to that true north, that purpose. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, you know, hindsight, of course, is twenty twenty, and, and I'm sure yeah. you can look back now and see. I mean, all the way to toilet paper entrepreneur, you were working to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty right. even then without even realizing it. That's, That's right. Really. That's absolutely right. So, yeah, so it does. It just seems to pull you. So uh, I, uh, you know, want to make sure I get to, to your, your latest book too, but uh, there's a book that I read called What You Can Change and What You Can't. Mm. That book, it's by Martin Seligman, who is the leader and the leader in positive psychology and that book really changed my life because it helped me to recognize, it, it just touches on exactly what you just said, that there's nothing wrong with me. Right. And I was looking outside of myself for, for these gurus to fix me, you know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with me. But there was a heck of a lot wrong with my business model. Mm. A heck of a lot wrong. So I'm in the process of completely, you know, working that. Now I'm, I've got a stronger and stronger model. So can you talk, uh, you talk a little bit about something like this in Profit First, where you recommend encouraging us not to change our habits, but to actually leverage them. Can you yes. explain what you mean by that? Yeah, so I think that the best entrepreneurs, the best business leaders realize that strengths can be amplified by miles, but weaknesses, they can be improved, but only by inches. And I think the typical response, the ordinary response is, where do I suck? Let me go back to school to fix that or go find an expert to fix that. You know, I'm horrible at accounting. You know, my attention to detail blows. I'm going to go back and find a way to improve on that. And you will make a modicum of improvements, these small pieces. But when we pick the strengths, I'm a really good public speaker. Uh, I can be very inspirational and motivational for a short period of time. I can get the team revved up. And we say, oh, let me go to school for that. Now you start learning the mastery level skills on persuasion and motivation or public speaking. Or maybe, maybe your strength is accounting. Now you go back to school for that and you learn the mastery level. That's what separates the extraordinary from the ordinary. And, and I'm, I'm convinced of it. The world's most accomplished people, the, the best authors, the, the best actors, the best speakers, realize strengths need to be amplified and then the weaknesses need to be either replaced or, or kind of put crutches in there, some kind of support structure. Right. Me, I'm not a details guy, and while I can do it and I try to force myself, I've never been able to sustain it. So I've brought on some detailed people that work with me. They're extraordinary. They blow my mind, their attention to details, and in turn, they avail me the time to do my strengths. So that's what we need to do. Build this Amplify we're great at and build an infrastructure. It doesn't have to be hiring people. It can be some tools. It can be an online assistant. There's always ways. There's definitely a way to do it. There's no excuse not to do it. Yeah, yeah. But I think that ultimately this gets back to two things, eradicating entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial poverty and the point you made early on in our conversation, which was that at some point you've got to systematize and get people who can do what, you know, is routine or rote to a degree, especially I think for us service professionals, that's critical because otherwise our model becomes nothing but 
a, almost a freelance model where you work on a project and you're not eating when you're not working. Right. So at some point, I think that that's probably what I call cocktail exercise is to sit back and think, I really need to bring in some other folks who can support me or tools, whatever it is that's going right. to leverage my time most effectively. Yeah, I think that fixing model, and I'm, I'm an old time HR person. Um, I think that is a corporate leftover too, part of our conditioning. Yes. Because what happens every year we get told what we're great at, but we're really told what we stink at. Right. What we're not we're, quite, you know. This areas is, of improvement. And, and it, it right. starts with grade school. It starts with kindergarten. It does. Oh, you didn't call her in the lines. You really need to improve that. You didn't right. do the math right. You need to strengthen up your math. The, right. the irony is what you're good at, maybe you put in an advanced placement class, but they don't say, you know what? Let's let's do four classes uh, a day dedicated to your English skills because you're so good at it. Right. No school does that, but they they do do this special education. We'll pull you aside. We'll get you going on math. Yeah. So we have to unwind that, and it's very difficult. It's so ingrained in our society. It is. It is, and we know we need math. I mean, we at least need to balance our checkbook, right? But I remember sitting there in in tears all summer, being forced to learn the the uh, multiplication tables. You know, my, mine was ironically. I remember, and I struggled with English. I got a, like a D, if I was lucky, in English. Uh, and this one particular teacher, Mrs. Kraus, was particularly critical of my work. She's like, "You, the way you write is not does not conform with the proper way to write literature. Uh, you sp you write almost in a speaking tone. You need to fix this." And now, as I wrote my books. That was the one thing I repelled. I think the, the normal response would be, Mrs. Krause was right. I, I got to write. Right. No, I, I, I've come to embrace my writing style is a very conversational style. It's just, just who I am. And now I'm trying to actually amplify that in the work I do. Yeah. But it's taken years to kind of unwind that criticism. Yeah, I think of it as you've got to go through some kind of detox over the, yeah. this baggage you carry around. And I think that that is for me. One of the things that I love about your writing, it's like you're just sitting here having coffee and you're telling me this. You know, that's what I hear in my head. Right, that's awesome. I just picture you sitting there. And I think that that's what makes your book so compelling. Not just is it great information, but it's great information told to you because that's, that's, you're not really reading it. it I, I feel like you're just telling me, here's how you need to do to fix this. And yeah. I think that's why your books are great. You know, it's funny, and, and how that works for me is as I write, I literally visualize that. I see myself sitting with you at a bar, and we have, uh, you know, a, a couple beers sitting there, and we're just shooting the bull. And you're like, you know, here's a challenge I'm facing. I'm like, well, let me tell you some experience that, that I've had that may help you with this uh, and navigate it. And because I can see that that tonality comes across. Um, but going back to our original point is – I don't think Mrs. Krauss or any people have ill intent. The, the rules always is follow the rules. Like that's always been the perpetual rules in, in, in our uh, corporate work and our schooling. The rules are follow the rules. And I, well, whatever. It, it's a shame, but we have to find a way to unwind that, focus on our strengths, and right. amplify it, even yeah. if your strengths are not within the normal rules. Right, right. And I think that's that critical thinking and that, that self-awareness that you realize that, oh, my God, what made me fabulous in corporate life, I need to detox from some of it, and then I need to modify and morph some, some of the other things, borrow what is effective, but really lose yes. the stuff that is dragging me down here. And there's a lot of the conditioning that, that can drag us down. So in... Two questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. One is, and since we were talking about math, this is appropriate. Okay. I love Profit First. I, Thank you. I read that book twice, and I need to read it a third time. Can, so let's say somebody wants to adopt this Profit First strategy. Mm. I'm not exactly a math whiz. So, so what should we do? What's the very first thing, other than read the book and take lots of notes? Yes. What's really next? Uh, first of all, embrace that you're not a math whiz, and, and that's actually the big benefit. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, I am not a math whiz myself, and what I did was I observed my natural behavior. So accountants and bookkeepers tell us, the traditional accountants and bookkeepers tell us the appropriate way to manage your business is to know your income statement, print that out, uh, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, 
tie them in together because the numbers play with each other, know the ratios that are important, the inventory turn, the operating cash ratio, every business must know this, run your KPIs, your key performance yep. indicators, and then tie it into your budget. And do that once, a, literally do that once a week and you will be attuned with where your business stands. And I noticed, I'm like, um, I, you know, you lost me the income statement. I just log into my phone and look at what my bank balance is. And based upon my bank balance, I make a determin, der, determination, a gut check and say, okay, I got money, I can buy stuff. But I don't have money, I won't. And if that is the natural behavior, we need to build a system around it. So profit first, when I wrote it, I realized that was my natural behavior and a natural behavior of many entrepreneurs. I suspect people listening right now check their bank balance for their business. So we're going to set up a system that works with the current behavior. The basics getting started is we're going to set up multiple accounts at your bank. So when you log into the bank account, you no longer have one account where all the money kind of piles up and then gets distributed. Thanksgiving, as we're recording this, Thanksgiving just passed by. I know when you had Thanksgiving dinner and that beautiful golden turkey was served, you didn't tell like, the, your friends and family there, oh, just eat off the serving tray. Everyone just dive in. No, you, you carve the turkey. You apportion it so everyone gets some. Well, that's what we do with Profit First. At your bank, we're going to set multiple plates, if you will. Each plate is where we're going to carve up some of that cash turkey. So money will come into your main account, and then we'll divide it up into accounts like a profit plate, a owner's pay plate, uh, one for taxes. Your business should be paying your taxes on your behalf, so a tax plate, and one for operating expenses. And now as money comes in, instead of $1,000 coming into that turkey tray and it's using that money up, $1,000 comes in, and then it gets carved up, and maybe we send 30% of it to operating expenses. So you don't have $1,000 to run your business, you have $300 to run your business. And just by carving money up into these different plates, you'll have an immediate perspective of where your business stands and what money is available for what purpose because it's been pre-allocated. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is just the simplest, most brilliant way of breaking this down. When I went, first went out on my own as a kid, you know, moved out of my mom's house, yeah. that, I, I worked with envelopes. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's envelopes the envelopes labeled, and it was the same thing when I was reading the book. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the online version of the envelopes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. I yeah. took the envelope system, and I took the pay yourself first principle, another one we're told in, in, in our personal lives, a couple other principles, blended them together. And it's, it, the idea is, just as we were talking about before, don't change who you are. If you have a natural process or behavior, let's actually amplify it. And that's what Profit First does. Yeah, yeah, and which makes it just so awesome. So I'm, I'm just finishing up Surge, which is your latest awesome. book, cool. which is really excellent. So I, I need to have a whole mic shelf now on my <laughs> book. And more are coming. I'm working on a new one right now. <laughs> oh, outstanding. That's great. So uh, a couple of things. One is let's just explain in a nutshell what this whole this concept of surge is, and then I'm going to ask you to pick your favorite child, which might be hard. So, so t explain what this concept of surge is because I really love it. Yeah, so surge is, uh, is about timing the market, and uh, one of my readers came to me and said, you know, love your books, which is, I love hearing that, and then said, but, which I don't like hearing that, <laughs> love your books, but no system, no process, nothing works if you're not in the right place at the right time. And like what I'm saying is, you, know, you and I, when we could say, you know, let's get into the typewriter business. Like I, let's, I'm feeling that. But <laughs> if there's no kind of consumer demand, we're not going to sell any typewriters. Just what we talked about before. You know, we have to identify our true north, our calling, and match it to customer demand. So when this person said, "How do you time the market?" I started studying it, and I found that while you can't perfect time in the market, you can radically improve the odds. So surge is about putting yourself in the right place at the right time to catch market momentum. And what happens is if you introduce a product where there's surging demand, all of your marketing is not nearly as powerful as the word of mouth. When more people want something than is available, everyone talks about it and consumption skyrockets. It's the first mover advantage. So surge is a five-step process. It's actually an acronym too, Surge. Mm -hmm. S stands for separate, pick the community that's, that's in a movement. Right. Basically, the riches are in the niches. U is unify their need, what we've been talking about. What's your true north? What's your calling? Um, but it's got to match the movement of the market. Uh, mm -hmm. Use a concept of a minimum viable product, something this guy Eric Reese wrote about in Lean Startup. What can you do that, that starts playing to what the market wants but also observes so you can improve it? R, have a rally cry. 
it, it's it's your true north. It's your purpose, but also it's a way to protect clients. Uh, there's a lot to it, but it, it's that one rallying message that people connect with. G is stands for gather. Once we start getting momentum from the market, one trap we fall into is we think that what got us to this point now is going to continue to the next point. It's not true. If you and I, Winnie, are are walking through a desert dying of thirst and someone's selling muddy water, we will buy that water as fast as we can and we'll chug it down. But it'll be a mistake for the vendor to say, oh, clearly muddy water is what people want to buy. <laughs> the next guy that comes with clean water is going to take that first guy out of business. So we have to realize when we introduce something to a surging market, even if it's inferior, customers will still buy it until a superior product or service comes out. We have to be the ones that actually up the game on ourselves. That's what the gather point is. Gather knowledge and improve. And then E stands for expansion. And I'm just adding a new thing now, which is called expertise. Uh, expansion is, I found that businesses that want to facilitate super growth, once they've mastered that first separated out, that niche community, they can actually clone the niches and go under radical expansion. But I also found that you don't have to necessarily become the next billion dollar company. I I'll tell you this. The right size business can find you. And whoever said a big business is a better business, that guy's a real jerk. That's not true. Bigger isn't better. Let the right size business find you. And you can expand, go bigger, or you can become an extraordinary expert. And the closing story I put in the book is about uh, a guy, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now, but he's the founder of the Cronut. And um, what he did was, this was a phenomenon about five, six years ago, blended a croissant with a donut. He was constantly testing and modifying his product until customers were raving about it. It exploded in popularity. I was one bakery in New York, and all these investors came in and said, we can franchise the cronut business. We can have hundreds of stores overnight. And he said, no, that's not, doesn't speak to who I am. I want one store that's famous. And he stayed small but he continues to innovate. And while others tried to clone the cronut, no one could pull it off, and he continues again and again inventing new stuff. So you can become an extraordinary expert. You don't have to go into massive expansion. That's the five steps of surge. So for those of you who are solopreneurs, for those of us who are solopreneurs who want to stay relatively small but create this great abundant business for ourselves, it's probably the expert path that we really want to follow. Yeah, in many cases, it's yeah. the expert. And what the expert means is that you've achieved a level of knowledge and ability that the general competition can't even yeah. touch. Right. Can't even touch. This is the pro athlete in a sport versus all the amateurs. Yeah, yeah I love to play tennis, but I'm not going to take on, you know, whoever the tennis pro is. Now. I would, listen, if Venus Williams wants to take me on, I, I'm done. I, I love to beat her. <laughs> But I, I don't want my ass kicked. Like she'll she'll destroy me. But she spends thousands and thousands and th you know tens of thousands of hours every year. I mean, maybe not ten thousand hours, but you know five thousand hours every single year perfecting her skill set. Me, I play tennis once a year, and the difference is nothing short of extraordinary. She makes millions playing tennis, and I get laughed off the court by my friend because I'm that bad. And that's the difference between a generalist and an expert. An expert is a devotion to your craft where you become world famous in your category. Yeah, that again is a great analogy and I think it gives us permission to say I'm leaving this stuff behind. It, it speaks again to becoming that big pumpkin in the patch and really amplifying your expertise because that's what people are willing to pay the higher ticket a massive problem. work for. Exactly. So, yeah, that's brilliant. So, okay, so to wrap this up, this has just been such fantastic information. I could go on for, for hours with you, but you'll be happy to hear I won't. <laughs> so, so let's, let's look at, you know, and, and of course we'll have links to the, all the resources and all these books, and, and Mike has fantastic downloadable tools that, that, you know, we'll have for you. So, but, there, you know, now you got this whole suite, this whole shelf in my office here. Where would somebody, where would you recommend that somebody get, just dive in? Is there one book that you think they should go to first? Yeah, well, I'll tell you my personal favorite, just okay. to enjoy I had writing it, but let me start off with this. 
I think the right book to start with is by first asking yourself, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in business right now? It may not even be my books, actually. It may be something else. Are you struggling with, with just the motivation of, of a startup, of, of getting by when you have no resources, no assets? Well, the, I wrote the toilet paper entrepreneur for that scenario. Are, are, you, are you struggling to, to experience that growth you want to have? Well, that's what the pumpkin plan is about. Um, are, are you struggling with profitability? Are you surviving check by check? That's what Profit First is about. Are, are, you, are you finding that you're marketing more and more but not getting momentum? Well, that, that's what Surge is about. But, but maybe you have other challenges. Uh, maybe um, you don't know how to make your product super or service offering super distinct. Well, I would read Purple Cow by Seth Godin. So there's there's tons of books out there so ask yourself what your biggest problem or biggest challenge is in your business and then seek out the book that answers that by the way you'll be most engaged i I've, I've been introduced to books that are phenomenal but i wasn't really interested in reading those just a friend said you got to read this book it's awesome and it didn't engage me until i was facing that problem and i was like oh my god this is exactly what i'm experiencing this is what i'm living and i i just went through it yeah so that's that's my answer that's awesome my personal preference though for my books i have the most joy writing actually the pumpkin plan. I, I think that's my best literary work and just whatever, but the most impactful hands down is profit first. I, I think that's been the game changer. I think that's going to be my legacy. I'm actually re-releasing the book through penguin uh, and, and, and thank to the world. Like, that's my goal is I, I want every entrepreneur that's ever faced any kind of cash crisis or cash struggle or just that check by check to, to be impacted by this book. So that's my mission. A pumpkin plan was my favorite. Outstanding. And, and they're probably my two favorites uh, so far anyway, but I really am enjoying Surge as well. And, and of course, we'll have links to all of them. Mike, I, I can't thank you enough for the time you've spent, the great information you've shared. It, it's been a joy talking to you. Of course, I'm, I'm no prejudiced. I always like talking to a Jersey guy anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. And as I said, we'll have all the links to the resources and everything else about where to find you. Mike's got a great video channel as well, so we'll have that, that YouTube link too. So thanks again and wish you all the best. Thanks, Winnie.